the wokeness scale is basically capturing skewed perceptions. Mm. And by skewed perception, I'm talking about on both ends. So if you're a poor person who's transsexual and not white, mm. you, you have ample evidence and experiences to support your view that you've been discriminated against. And if you're a white, straight person with you know, middle-class background, you look around and say, well, what, what discrimination? You don't see it. Mm. And, and so these, these people live in really different environments, and they just feel uncomfortable to look at the other side. Co, do you want to start? Yeah, should we get started? Sure. Um, Co, welcome back, everyone. On the podcast, we have uh, Professor Paul Jones. Um, for the beginning, do you want to give a background as to uh, how you ended up at um, Victoria University and where you came from? And sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on. This is this is fun, <laughs> and I'll I'll attempt to be. Um, clear and interesting. Those are the two things I, I try to do when I lecture. I've been at Victoria for 21 years. So I came in 22 years, I guess. So I came in 2001, January of 2001, and brought my wife and three, three young children over, and we settled in New Zealand, became citizens. And um, as somebody who studied cross-cultural psychology around the world, literally data from all over the world, it was fun to pick up from Chicago and come and settle in a new country, which um, has been an ongoing adventure for 22 years. And um, that's how I came to be here. I, I found a home and uh, made a place for myself at Victoria. I, I teach a number of courses that that are large courses so i run into former students all over new zealand interestingly i was in the core mandel vacationing once and the the young lady behind the, the counter when she saw me said you you <laughs> <laughs> i said yeah me <laughs> and uh, she had had me as a professor some years before she recognized me. Of course, I didn't recognize her because I teach to classes of 200, 300 at a time, and I don't get to know all the students. But it's, it's great to um, make those connections to uh, live in such a friendly country. And I've learned a lot about New Zealand in the time that I've been here. And, and some of the work I'm going to be talking about later about wokeness comes out of that. Oh. Cool. So from later, should we start now then? Did you did you want to give us an idea of wokeness in terms of what it is and what got you into studying it? Yeah, that's that's several questions. <laughs> so I'll try to I'll try to answer them in the in the sense of how I've lived it. So I I my focus in psychology is developmental psychology. So I got my PhD in psychology many years ago. And I have very diverse and broad interests. So I have done research on social psychology, personality psychology, individual differences, um, cross-cultural psychology, and more recently, positive psychology. And, and I think that diversity of interest has led me to come to the place where I'm realizing that political psychology is actually a very important and interesting field of study, um, not the least of which we study real world consequences of people believing certain things. So during the pandemic, even before the pandemic, but particularly during the pandemic, we've heard of all of these crazy conspiracy theories. And like any rational human being, I've thought, why? why? Why are people using these conspiracy theories during a pandemic where your life is literally on the line? You believe something that seems to be emotionally comforting to you, but actually may put you in harm's way. Okay. So I, I've been um, slowly moving in the direction of political psychology over the last decade. And I, and I read voluminously um, in terms of current 
affairs, political um, activity in obviously New Zealand, but also my country of origin, which is the United States, uh, where frankly, the, the United States is a laboratory of crazy in terms, <laughs> in, in terms of politics, certainly. And there's a, a big part of me that um, <laughs> can view what's going on in America um, at a distance. And one of the things that I've noticed, I'm answering your question, one of the things I've noticed over the last 10 years, maybe 15, is that there's been this increased use of the term wokeness. And I will, in the, in the course of this interview, I'll say wokeness, I'll say wokeism, I'll say woke attitudes or woke behavior. I'm all talking mm -hmm. about the, the same thing. So, um, so I was reading about wokeness and trying to make sense of it like a psychologist. And what I realized pretty early on was that people, when they talked about it, almost never defined it, but yet they would use it as a way to help their followers or their, the people who vote for them to think that that politician is, is working in their interests. Okay, so on the on the left, the, the political spectrum on the on the left handed side, we in the United States we call them Democrats. In New Zealand, it's typically Labour or the Green Party. They're variously called progressives, liberals. Um, they would talk about wokeness as kind of a natural evolution of being concerned about all people in a society and, and, and trying to speak up for people who are disadvantaged and marginalized at the, at the fringes of society, who, who have been dispossessed by, um, by people in power. And I noticed that people on the right-hand side of the political spectrum, the conservatives, uh, the Tories in, in the UK, um, the nationals here, and so forth, tend to use wokeness as a pejorative term. Pejorative means that it implies that there is a negative connotation, that something bad and evil and destructive about wokeness. So a lot of people on the right talk about wokeness as this bad thing, they don't define it, but they decide they describe it as bad. And people on the left, when they talk about it, they tend to think of it, talk about it as something that's positive. And just as an observer, I um, was attempting to wrestle with, for me, the fundamental question is, what are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> are they even talking about the same thing? And, and I've come to the conclusion after reading a lot of political commentary that uh, kind of they're not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and that, to me, as a psychologist, as a, a psychologist, frankly, whose whole training, and I'm, I'm 40 plus years at this point, has been to try to operationalize, try to define clearly and come up with very specific definitions of whatever psychological construct that I'm talking about, whether it's how you regulate emotions or whether you're depressed or if, if you engage in narcissism, what does that mean and so forth. So in psychology, an enormous amount of effort goes into defining and operationalizing. So that's the stage that I'm at with the, the wokeness debate. Mm -hmm. And let me just add one more thing um, before I let you come in with another question. <laughs> I'm not trying to dominate the conversation here, but I'm trying to answer fully uh, what, what Sahir is asking here. So the definition of wokeness, as I'm saying, is fluid right now. So if you ask people, how do you define wokeness, you're going to get a, a wide range of different kinds of definitions. But let me, let me jump in and, and say that uh, I can talk a little bit about the historical roots of the term, and I can talk about how it is defined by most people who uh, work in this area, and then we can come back to what are the implications of that. 
So the, the first instance of the use of the word woke um, occurred in a early 20th century song, Statesboro Boys, I believe it was the name of the song, by Huddy Letbetter, who was an African-American blues singer and about 100 years ago. He, he wrote the song, and there's a phrase in there about being woke to the racial discrimination that Blacks uh, experienced at that time. So the term woke within the African, African American community um, became part of the vernacular, became a, a phrase, a word that then popped up. Um, later, and I think it was the 1940s, a play by Langston Hughes, in which a black character talks about wanting to stay woke to the realities of black people being discriminated against. Mm -hmm. So the the term woke, they didn't say wokeness, they said woke just, and, and, and they were borrowing off of the common uh, language of awakening to a new realization about something. Um, so the term woke then began to carry with it an awareness of um, long-term prejudice and discrimination against black people in the country. So the thread, if we take it forward, is that wokeness has been associated with uh, the Black Lives Matter into the 21st century. So 10 to 15 years ago, with the um, emergence of BLM as a um, impactful political actor on the American political scene, the term wokeness got associated with them. So in many ways uh, in, in the United States, wokeness has as its core idea um, an awareness and sympathy for people who have experienced racism in the American context. But it's gotten broadened since then, so it's obviously um, passed over the shores to Europe and Great Britain and, and down under. So, so pretty much in the Western society now, we have a widespread use of the word wokeness to refer to um, this, this notion. Interestingly, the term wokeness has been broadened in the last 10 years. So it mm -hmm. used to be only tied to the awareness and sympathy for victims of racism, but now um, other people, particularly liberals and progressives, have, have said uh, to themselves and to other people, well, maybe we could also be woke to other kinds of social injustice. Racism is terrible. It's, it's in many ways the original sin of the founding of the United States. Uh, so slavery was right there at the beginning of, of that country, and they've been wrestling with it ever since. They're a long way from um, really coming to grips with it. But there's other kinds of social injustice as well. And so um, what's happened in the last five to ten years is that a number of other types of social injustice have been talked about using the same language, particularly the word wokeness and being woke to other forms of social injustice. And, and that kind of leads me to um, where I am today. I've created a, a self-report wokeness scale that has racism as a very important dimension in it, but I've added four others that I think are often associated and affiliated with racism. So if you are woke to racism, are you also woke to these other four types? And if it's okay, I can... Go for it. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'm on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll lay out these, these other four, and then we can stop, and you can ask me other questions of clarification. Okay, so in my reading... Um, it seems to me that there's a number of different important social inequities that are talked about 
sometimes side by side with racism, racism, but but sometimes completely separately. So sexism is a profoundly ubiquitous phenomenon where girls and women are not given equal opportunity to boys and men. And the um, the women's liberation, that phrase may not mean a whole lot to you, but I was in the United States in the late 60s when black power and women's liberation came to the forefront in terms of political discourse. And women's liberation attempted to raise consciousness about the fact that that girls and women are discriminated against. And that it didn't start then, but um, uh, it, it was, uh, it was a, an interesting moment of political organization and um, uh, expression of passion that those of us who came of age in the late 60s during the Vietnam War and a whole bunch of other really terrible things in the United States at that time, to me, I, I, they kind of made sense going together. I, I guess I still feel that way, that, um, that sexism and racism uh, share some characteristics. And they are also very different uh, in some other ways, but, but maybe we could talk about them as allied social injustices. The third one is heterosexism. Heterosexism is defined as the discrimination against people who are not heterosexuals, essentially. So if you're cisgender, um, that's the norm. That's considered to be normal. And everybody else is considered to be literally, uh, for many, many years, abnormal. Um, the American Psychiatric Association defined homosexuality as a sexual deviancy um, up until the late 20th century. So the discrimination that is tar- that that is targeting people who are not heterosexuals is very prominent in the United States right now. The, the antipathy toward transsexuals is unbelievable. Uh, there, are, there are governments and states in the United States passing laws specifically targeting transsexual people and other people who don't fit the, the, um, the usual um, dichotomy that, that most people are used to. Um, it's, it's a bit of a witch hunt in a way that I don't see in New Zealand. Maybe I'm a little sheltered from it here in New Zealand, but I don't see the same fervor and the same kind of political activism against non-heterosexuals here as compared to the U.S. And I think Europe and and Britain is is actually probably similar to New Zealand. Australia, I I don't have a clue. I don't know what's going on with them. But anyway, that's the third one. I will get through all all four of them. The fourth one is class discrimination. So we don't often think about this, but the poor are discriminated against in a multitude of ways that a lot of middle-class people just don't notice. Um, A a way to kind of sum this up is, is to come up with the phrase that I hear often, being poor is hard work. And what they mean by that is a poor person has to spend an inordinate amount of time and resources just to get the basic things. So they have to take a bus to get to work if they have a job. So they spend all that time on the bus and they don't have a car. They, they have, if the bus breaks down or is late, which you know occasionally happens in Wellington, maybe you have experienced it, <laughs> uh, you're out of luck. And, and you know, there's so many different ways that uh, poor people are discriminated against. In New Zealand, to be fair, less so than in the United States. In the United States, poor people are um, badly treated by a lot of social and governmental agencies. So the 
pathways to get access to the safety net and is difficult for poor people and they don't make it easy. Um, and so you don't, it kind of recedes into the background. We don't have a um, kind of a daily awareness of it, or at least most, most people don't. But it is a significant portion of the population who struggle every day with just basic things like food and lodging and, and health care and so forth. The fifth one, the fifth social injustice, um, is called Christian nationalism. And Christian nationalism is probably more relevant for the American context than for here, but I'll tell you what it is and then you can judge for yourself. Christian nationalism is the belief system that Christianity should be the state religion, in short. And what that means um, is that instead of government sitting above religion in terms of affecting the average person, in fact, they want to reverse that. In the United States, there are people who are proposing that churches and pastors and religious leaders should dictate to government what their policies should be. And that, I, you know, I, I don't hear that in New Zealand. I think in New Zealand, uh, it, it's, it's one of the most um, secular countries in, in the world. So Christianity and other religions are less prominent and less active in New Zealand in terms of um, trying to have any impact on policy, but in the United States there are a large number of people um, who would love to see theocracy operating uh, above government. And that, if that sounds familiar, you can go back a few hundred years um, in Europe and that's what you had. You had um, the Catholic Church in many cases ruling over countries. And um, that got, got upended, but there are still people who would like to see a return to the rule of, of Christian theocracy um, because that's their authority. They, that, that's the authority they believe in rather than government. So there's a, a, a repositioning of democracy versus, which is the will of the people, versus theocracy, which is the will of people who run religious organizations. Okay, so those are the five dimensions of uh, social injustice. So I've created this self-report scale. I've collected a lot of data, actually. Um, over a thousand people here in New Zealand, over a thousand people in the United States. And the, the analyses that I've done so far, um, I'll translate that. The, the uh, statistical evaluations that I've made of the scale thus far, and I won't get into the weeds on this, uh, are very promising. It looks like, and this is a, a really important finding in my eyes, that those five different types of social injustice correlate quite well, quite positively. So the, the way to translate that is to say, if somebody is woke in regard to racism, they're also probably woke in terms of sexism, heterosexism, class discrimination, and Christian nationalism. So they tend to hang together. On the positive side, so somebody who's woke will endorse um, the items, I'll read you one here in just a sec, that are capturing awareness and sympathy for marginalized minorities in those five domains. And I just want to clarify that if somebody rejects those items and they end up on the other side of wokeism, those are people who are not woke in those five areas. So those they, those tend to hang together. So mm -hmm. if you're not woke in terms of sexism, you, in other words, you don't see sexism in, in your everyday life, you don't really believe that racism goes on as much as these people talk about it. You know, mm -hmm. class discrimination, aren't we over that? You know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So there, there are really interesting and, and large differences of opinion on these things. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's very interesting. I feel like I have lots of questions. Um, I'm curious to know a bit more about kind of what the, the opposite of wokeness is. Is yeah. that kind of um, 
discriminating beliefs or yeah yeah anti I it's not just me but in the in the commentary that you read you'll talk about woke views and you'll hear about anti woke views okay and I think that's a really important um thing to talk about so let me let me say a couple of things about it I like the term anti-woke because the people who endorse that end of the continuum are actually opposed to wokeism. Um, why don't I read an item or two and, and we can get a yeah. concrete sense of it. Mm. So here is a woke um, item that if you endorse it, you would be considered woke. And it goes like this. I am concerned about discrimination and prejudice directed at people of socially marginalized groups such as Maori and Pacifica. Okay, so that's obviously a racism item. It's pointed in the woke direction. So if you endorse that as, you know, this is how I feel, then you would be on the woke side. Um, here is an anti-woke item. It goes like this. In recent years, some media and public figures have begun to dis discriminate against white people finding ways to prioritize Maori and Pacifica over European New Zealand. Mm. Okay. So if you endorse that second item at a high level, I would call those people not woke or anti-woke. If you endorse the first one, then you would be considered woke or more progressive and more sympathetic to, to marginalized people. All right. So your question is, what's going on with the anti-woke side of things? So these are... These, let me describe them um, based on my research as well as other people. They tend to be older. They tend to be white. They tend to be men. They tend to be uh, more well-to-do people. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about the... Um, status quo, per se? Sorry? Status quo, per se? Or like, just talking about... They, they, they're, they're the people who have power in society, okay? And woke views are basically questioning the current power dynamic, which is generally governed by, let's go through the list, white, males, heterosexual, more well-to-do, and probably of a Christian faith. Um, so when, by the way, I should, full disclosure, I should say I am white. <laughs> I'm an older, <laughs> older male. Um, I grew up in a middle class um, environment in the United States. Um, I'm heterosexual, and uh, I was raised in the Christian faith. So uh, <laughs> full disclosure. <laughs> um, so it, just because you belong to a particular grouping that's being discriminated against or or on the other side uh, traditionally and conventionally have a lot of power in society it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to end up woke or anti-woke all right so i consider myself pretty woke but um, if you look at the, my demographics they would imply they would suggest that i probably would be more anti-woke all right um so that that aside, I'm, I'm, a, I'm sort of an outlier, I suppose, and unusual, and, and I, I attribute to that to a, to a life lifetime in psychology and studying uh, all the ways that uh, people are mistreated by other people. Uh, Do you mean unusual to pick up this kind of topic? Unusual in the sense that a lot of the people who are anti-woke tend to fall into my profile. So they tend to be older males from a Christian faith and so forth. So I'm unusual in the sense that my demographics don't predict my attitudes about wokeness. Um, but it's but it's not a perfect correlation. I hope you're you're understanding this. So there are people out who will listen to this podcast who will think, all right, well, I'm female, but I'm not. I don't really think that sexism is a big thing. I just, you know, I've run into it a few times, but it's not a big thing. Um, and that's fine. I mean, there's a lot of variability with regard to how demographics predict political attitudes. So let me just insert at this point um, another 
phrase that you might have heard of, which is identity politics. All right, so some people believe that identity politics are the same as being woke. And I would say, no, they're related, but uh, it's actually pretty complicated. So identity politics would imply that I should be anti-woke based on my demographic profile, but in fact, I'm not. All right, so do most women uh, express a concern about sexism and want to pass and get government to pass laws to protect women's health and um, that kind of thing, equal access to um, work opportunities and so forth? Yes, most women do. Not all women do, however. So identity politics is a gen generalization. It's, it's saying that on average, if you fall into a particular demographic group, a particular political identity, that means that you're going to feel, you know, in particular ways about uh, governmental policies. It's not a perfect correlation. Um, so there, there will be, um, for example, racial groups who don't believe that racism is a big problem. Okay, there are. Um, Christians who are actually very sympathetic to discrimination against Muslims and so forth. So um, it's, it's not a perfect correlation, and I'm not suggest suggesting that it is or that it should be, but it, it's just um, a demonstration, I think, about the complexity of human experiences. So based on where you were born, where you, were, where, where you grew up, what your experiences were. Did you have good or bad experiences around sex and around race and around religion and, and these sorts of things? Those kinds of pivotal events could push you or pull you in certain ways where you end up with either a woke or an, or an anti-woke attitude. And down the road, if, if if I continue in this direction, I'd really love to look at that. Um, I was wondering, so other people who have answered these questions, what people think about uh, wokeness. Like, so for a lot of people, like you've said, um, wokeness is kind of like has a negative connotation. Um, yeah, so what do people think about that? Some people might not want to label themselves as woke, some people might See, it's like a really good thing. What do you think? Yeah, it's I, I see attitudes about wokeness uh, coming organically out of uh, more fundamental values and beliefs that they hold. All right, so I think the direction goes something in, in, in this way that based upon your experiences, you steer more in a conservative or a liberal direction, and then you end up joining a party and voting for a party that reflects your values. So if you're more conservative in, in New Zealand, you would steer toward the national party, and, and their politicians would do things that you would agree with, mostly. All right, so let's just take this, be more specific about it. Judith Collins, a couple of years ago, complained publicly that the name Aotearoa was being used so much to name our country. She was complaining about that as a bad thing. Okay? And then certain um, newspapers and political commentators came out and applauded her for fighting against those woke attitudes. Okay, this is a very specific example, all right? And so what, what I think is happening is that wokeness is um, a couple of steps removed from the political values that, that motivate people to vote for one candidate as opposed to another. And then when then they pay attention to what those politicians say, uh, for example, what Judith Collins said, and then on the basis of that, decide whether they're going to vote for her again. You know? and, and the term wokeness is applied by political actors and by commentators as to that's woke or that's anti-woke and, mm -hmm. and so forth as a shorthand guide for their tribe to 
think about that policy. So the, the, there could be people out there who don't really have an opinion about Aotearoa as a name for the country, and then they hear um, a commentator applauding Collins for using that term, uh, you know, opposing that term and calling it anti-woke, and they're thinking to themselves, well, anti-woke is bad, so therefore I must be in favor of Collins, and maybe I'll vote for her next time. So right. it, it's part of the political equation, but it's um, my complaint that I started off this interview with is that we don't have a good definition of it. Um, the people, people's conceptions of what wokeism is is just all over the map. And so the, the, this commentary and this labeling of that's woke or that's anti-woke is very confusing. Do you... Do you reckon you could give us an example of people talking past each other in the term of woke, wokeness or anti-wokeness? Because I feel anti-wokeness, as you said, essentially is just like, that thing must be bad, therefore the whole thing's bad. Um, so could you give an example of how they talk past each other? Yes. So I'm going to come up with an American example here, sorry. Um, the governor of Florida... Is a man by the name of Ron DeSantis, a Republican. He's a conservative. And he re just got reelected uh, to be governor of Florida a month or so ago. And he was, he famously said, Florida, quote, Florida is the place where woke goes to die, end mm -hmm. quote. So what he is doing is he is very uh, fundamentally establishing his reputation and his persona in the political sphere around the issue of being anti-woke. And so what is he trying to do in terms of policy? So one of the things that he's trying to do is that in the United States, there are advanced placement educational modules that students and high school can take um, on particular topics, and one of them is African American history. And so, let me, let me just add that there are multiple uh, modules for a whole bunch of different topics, including other races. He looks at all of those different modules and he says that one, the African American module, talking about the the experience of slaves who were liberated and, and their life in the United States, that's the one that I'm going to target for deletion. So he is working as governor to remove that one module from all of the curriculum because he says, quote, it has no educational value. Okay. All right. So to his followers, I'm, I think I'm answering your question. To his followers, the people who voted for him, um, they would look at that and say, yeah, I applaud that. I, I like that. I, you know, he is fighting the war against these liberal types who are uh, using propaganda to tell a false story about the racial reality of blacks in the United States. Mm -hmm. They like that, right? Of course, <laughs> there's a large group of people in Florida. It could be, actually be a majority of people, I'm not sure. If so, they didn't come out to vote. Who would look at that and go, that's really perplexing. Why would you pick just that module, which, which is uh, based on his historical facts? Yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not propaganda. It's actually who did what, when, and how, and what are the statistics, and it just personal accounts of slaves and so forth. It's heart-wrenching to, to actually look at the, the curriculum. Um, so the people who don't support DeSantis would look at that behavior and, and, and think, that's racist. That, it, there's just no other word for it. But the division as such in the United States, that the people who support DeSantis really resent being called racist because they like DeSantis doing this sort of thing. But on the other side, on the so-called woke side, more progressive side, you'd look at that and you'll go, well, there's really only one label I can think of 
for that behavior. That's that's racism. That's targeting specifically targeting a racial minority for um, negative consequences. Right. So so I think your question and and you know follow up with me if I'm not answering it well. But there there are these arguments, these these um, political conflicts that are being acted out in terms of governmental policy. And the commentary about it often uses wokeness or anti-wokeness as a shorthand way of labeling where it falls on this continuum. So what he's doing would definitely fall on the anti-woke side. And in New Zealand, I just read um, a, a wonderful article coming out of, um, it was either Waikato, I think it was by Cato, uh, an article written about the decolonization of the curriculum um, in New Zealand, where there is a reevaluation of historical accounts within this within this country over the last several hundred years, attempting to view the um, relationships between the indigenous Maori and the, the white settlers who, who came to the country, giving it a fair, more um, balanced account. And that's called decolonization of, of, of generally. But the decolonization of the curriculum means to look broadly in, in your curriculum and think about ways in which the, the Western ways of thinking and doing things and, and resorting to historical precedents perhaps biases the way we think and, and talk about pretty much everything in the curriculum. So that is pretty uncontroversial in New Zealand. I mean, most people, I think, would be on board with that. There would be some people who oppose it, of course. But that that for a woke person you look at that and you read the article like I did and think that makes a lot of sense. And DeSantis would hate it. <laughs> so there's there's it, it, there's an interesting dynamic that's going on right now where the the this continuum of wokeness to anti wokeness is being used as a thermometer, if you will, mm -hmm. with regard to where something falls. Mm -hmm. okay, is is so and so a politician on the woke side or the anti-woke side? Or is this policy here or there? Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering, do you think wokeism translates into um, action or activism? So if they have this awareness, do you think that actually um, the picture of grows into action? And that's an excellent to... question. Mm -hmm. And let me give you my opinion. <laughs> And that's, that's really a, a question we need to study. My response goes like this. So if you, if you look at the items in my measure, right, if you look at the definition that I'm using for wokeism, it's awareness and sympathy for marginalized minorities. Okay, it's nothing about action in there. So this is, I think, the core set of beliefs of wokeism. You're asking the question, let's say you're very woke or you're very anti-woke, does that have implications for behavior? And I would say probably, but um, as, as we know in the field of psychology, just because you have a set of values and beliefs, that doesn't necessarily translate directly and unambiguously to a particular behavior. Um, there are people who are very woke who, who are very strong out there political activists, absolutely. Um, but there are also very well people who aren't. They're sympathetic and they'll vote for politicians uh, who endorse those views, but, but they won't be out there demonstrating and marching or necessarily giving money to particular campaigns. So there's an additional um, uh, uh, factor that we have yet to identify really with what makes somebody move from um, just merely being woke to somebody who would be more demonstrative and, and more real world of, a, of an activist. And I don't have an, an answer for that. Um, but there are certainly 
woke activists who are trying to push back against the anti-woke elements of society. And the anti-woke people really don't like that. Um, they, they spend a lot of time, uh, Collins, I, I gave you that example before, she went out of her way to make that observation. She didn't have to do that. I mean, and, and you know, if she attempted to try to get a law passed to say that you can't refer to New Zealand as Aotearoa, where do you think that'd go? It wouldn't go anywhere. All right. So she is, she is um, displaying her anti-wokeness like a flag. And she, she believes it helps her, otherwise she wouldn't do it. Um, but the people on the anti-woke end of the continuum uh, fight continually against efforts to try to redress um, inequities that marginalized minorities have experienced historically or you know, still today. I, mean, I, I don't want anybody to assume that I'm talking about uh, social injustices that were in the past and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Many of these, all of these, I think, um, are still current. And But there have been great... Um, there have been great harms perpetrated in history that need to be redressed. And I think New Zealand's doing that with regard to the Maori. Um, you can argue about how quickly it's going and whether it's really adequate or not. Oh, I was going to ask you on that. Um, because you said it doesn't necessarily, tra wokeism doesn't necessarily translate to action. Do you think it has something to do with the policies as well? Like if some, like you mentioned, Ron DeSantis's policy and how we can identify it as racist, can you identify woke policies and whether people were, uh, and whether people who actioned it, uh, actioned it with like a good amount of effectiveness? Do you think like the policies that would actually work and that depends on someone's wokeness or understanding of the situation? Yeah, that's a, that's a complicated question. Um, my, my feeling is, and tell me if this isn't responsive to your question, I don't think that people oppose or support policies or politicians for the sake of wokeness. Mm -hmm. They don't say, um, I'm a woke person, therefore I would necessarily support this policy, which I haven't ever seen before. I just saw it today, and it, it looks like a woke policy, so I, I have to support it. I, I don't think it works that way. I think, I think people support policies and politicians because of their core values and beliefs uh, about the world, but also about how the role of government in trying to redress uh, inequities in the system and then later, down the road, it might be labeled as woke or anti-woke. Um, so I want to, I'm trying to make a distinction that I think that the, the term wokeness gets applied after the fact in most cases. Now, Collins, she did not attack it, the, the term Aotearoa from the point of view of, I am opposed to woke policies, therefore I think this is a bad idea. She didn't she didn't invoke wokeness uh, mm -hmm. from the quote that I saw. Uh, that was applied later by a, a political commentary to try to make sense of things. Mm -hmm. So I think that this dimension of wokeness is an attempt to make sense of a very complicated, messy world. Mm -hmm. So if you if you can order politicians and policies and other attitudes and even behaviors on this continuum, if you can unambiguously lay, place a particular thing on that continuum, then that helps you understand and explain it. Uh, my, my problem is, as I said before, um, you may get tired of me saying this, is that um, I think across this dimension, we're operating under different definitions. Mm -hmm. um, pretty different definitions. So I, it doesn't explain things <laughs> as well as people think it does. And in fact, often as a woke person, I'll, I'll hear something like DeSantis labeling something woke, 
and I'll go, no, no, I don't really agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> and why do I think that? Because I think he's weaponizing the term woke to artificially create a um, wedge issue, a division in his favor. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. And in the end, to be fair, I think some woke people will do the same on the other side. So they'll label something anti-woke when, in fact, it isn't. So, I mean, you could quibble with me as to, you know, DeSantis' uh, attempt to um, get rid of this particular advanced placement curriculum as, you know, you could say you're wrong to call that anti-woke. Okay, I'm willing to entertain that possibility. I, I, I don't know everything, and, and that may be an inappropriate usage. But there are a whole bunch of actors out there, political actors and commentators, who are attempting to explain this extremely complex and ever-changing world of, of, of political um, activity and this wokeness scale I think is turning out to be one of their favorite ways to try to make sense of it. But there is a fundamental error here, which is that we're not all talking about the same thing. Yeah, I like I like what you said about someone might weaponize something even though you might not think it's woke or anti-woke. Like with the example of DeSantis, someone could probably argue he's being woke by banning things because when in media you see it a lot that the moment something's banned or someone's cancelled it is by the left quote unquote and both right. people are the ones banning things not the other way right so it's well, not yeah. yeah let me talk about cancel culture for just a bit there you go um, <laughs> good question um there is there is a perception on the conservative right that the only people who engage in cancel culture are the people on the left right yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of discourse put out by the conservative right that, oh, here the left goes again trying to cancel a right wing uh, speaker or policy or cause. That, you know, those dastardly progressives are using uh, cancel culture. And of course, of course, <laughs> cancel culture is bad. What they fail to completely understand is that cancel culture goes on on both sides, and I and I wouldn't even argue that one is more than that does one more than the other. So there are a lot of conservative people who uh, cancel, don't support liberal causes, don't support um, progressive corporations, and so forth. Um, I think to a roughly equal extent to which left-leaning progressives don't buy products or don't watch TV shows or don't listen to podcasts by right-wing um, figures. Okay, um, so I guess I'm at the place where I don't apologize for this. I don't apologize for cancel culture on either side. I I think that if um, woke people are going to stand by their beliefs and not pay money to a corporation that is uh, promoting anti-woke attitudes. Makes sense to me. And I, I don't really think there's a problem if conservative people, for their political views, don't send their kids to a liberal arts college. Okay? I think it's unfortunate, but they have that oh, right. No, 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 no. Oh, it's resetting. Oh, I was just in the middle of a great thought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that hurts. I hope oh. I didn't lose the whole thing. I wonder why it's restarting now. Oh, please, please don't tell me we lost the whole thing. To be fair, we've that's why we recorded it here. At least there will be something. But that hurts. Oh. So the audio might not be as good. Yeah. Why did it do that? I think mm. it's an anti-war corporation, corporation. Or IBM that was fighting back against me. Someone's listening to mm. us. Exactly. Uh, Must be. There's no other 
explanation for this. Yeah. It's no wackier than some other conspiracy theories. <laughs> um, I was going to say, though, in my head, my perception is that often cancelling can be things like demonetizing on YouTube or people losing their jobs. And like that's what I imagine is. Yeah, should we just continue? And I, I presume this is still on. Yeah, that's still on, so we can. Okay, well, we can wrap it up whenever you want to. Yeah. So, why don't you rephrase your question for the sake of? Oh the... yes. Um, I guess in my mind, I had a different um, understanding of cancelling. Like cancelling as being, you know, people losing their jobs or um, social media sites uh, taking down content and things like that. Yes. Mm. So. So uh, canceling can happen in a whole bunch of different domains. So you can choose not to buy a product provided by a particular company or corporation. You can choose not to watch um, a TV show or a podcast or a radio show. You can be fired from work uh, or from a ministry if, if you don't uh, adhere to certain basic norms and mm. so forth so there, there are there's a lot of um gradations of how overt and how noticeable <clears throat> canceling is mm. so when you choose not to buy something that's not as overt as firing somebody or demonstrating with pickets outside um a, a corporation headquarters for example um but but all of those make a difference, and that's why uh, the business world is, to a great extent, petrified of backlashes along this wokeism dimension. So are you aware of the um, controversy around M&M's candies? Oh, was it that there's a, there's a lady M&M, and is that it? Well, there were several characters yeah. um, that were created by the Mars corporation that, that makes M&M's. So there were, I don't know, five or six different characters, some female, some male. Yeah, and they're the M&M's. The, yeah. 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 And the right-wing conservative media in the United States took umbrage at this because they they thought that, um, that the M&M's portrayed these aberrant and unusual and the translation I would give is non-normative sex roles. Yeah. Okay. So there was a, a I think an, the the almond M M&M, and M, which is the biggest one, was mm. purple and female. Yeah. And Tucker Carlson uh, made some snide comment about, well, that must be the fat lady. Mm. You know, the, the trope about unattractive women. Yeah. And that kind of thing. It's, I still don't get the fact that you, you've lost me at the chocolate pieces, like them being anthropomorphized in any way man, woman, child really doesn't, like if you're concerned about that, then there's already issues here. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true psychologist. Uh, well, before the M&Ms was the Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head um, <laughs> controversy, which was a couple of years ago. Is that from Toy Story? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it was... A real toy before yeah. it got into Toy Story, um. the movie. So I grew up in the fifties and sixties, and you could just get a potato out of the kitchen, and yeah. then you, you would buy this package where, which would have arms and legs and heads and nose and so forth. Yeah. And there was a Mister Potato Head and a Mrs. Potato Head, and that's what we grew up with. And it was it was the normative um, heterosexual split mm. that that. The conservative right just adores. I mean, there there could be no exception to anything <laughs> other than that. And so the the company, I think, I I can't remember exactly how it all unfolded, but the company, I think, just went to Potato Head rather than Mister and Missus Potato Head. Um, and the conservative right lost their mind because, <laughs> of course, potatoes are gendered and you have to have a Mr. and a Mrs. And just to make it unisex doesn't make any sense to them. So I, I, I'm not going any further with that. But so it, this, it's, a, it's really a schism. It, it's really a dividing point um, between the conservative right and the, and the liberal left. 
around the issues of, and you see this over and over and over again, it's, it's around issues of gender, so it's around issues of race, it's around issues of money and who's well-to-do and so forth and so forth. Religions in there, and um, those are those are um, what's the word I'm looking for? Those are issues that will never die for the conservative right because they they have this vision of the past, the sacrosanct, um, which is what Donald Trump ran on as his um, public pledge, which is to make America great again. In other words, take it back to the 1950s. Well, I actually grew up in the 50s, and I can tell you it wasn't so hot <laughs> in particular ways. But it was it was an era in which black people knew their place, you know? And you would you would take the family to church on Sunday and for some people it was a very uh, ordered, sensible satisfying life and they yearn for that there's this nostalgia for the way things used to be which was better than what we have now and and, and what's different now because well we've got all these transgender people who never existed before who now are threatening my sense of what gender is all about mm -hmm. and it's very upsetting to them and and they they voice that yeah interesting um so as far as you know, this is, uh, or your scale, is the the first or only sort of psychological yes. defined construct? Yeah. Yes. Mm. So I, I found a dissertation in the U.S. that's based entirely on racism, which is great, by the way, mm. uh, but it's the dissertation. I haven't found a printed, published version of it. And then I found a working paper from Australia where they, they, they had a single question about wokeism, and they... they did some statistical analyses of the score on that single item with other characteristics like cancer culture and so forth, and that's good. But um, we really need a fully formed, multi-dimensional uh, conception of wokeness, like what I think my scale does, um, in order to really capture the, the complexity and the nuance of it. And, and I want to get it out there. I want to publish it and, and have people react to it. And, and, I, and I think people on the left will, will look at it and say, that makes sense to me. In fact, they'll probably want to add a few more dimensions. And I've been thinking about that. Mm -hmm. People on the other side, the anti-woke side, will fight against it. They will um, propose that it's wrongheaded, that it's missing things, that it's... Um, it's obviously distorted and biased. And I will come back and I'll say, no, it's not biased and distorted because half of the items are woke and the other half of the items are anti-woke. And I will read out an item and I would say, do you endorse that item? And they would, if they're honest, they would say, yes, I would. I've read you one before. Um, they would say, you know, racism is overstated. Sexism doesn't exist anymore. We don't discriminate, discriminate against the poor. They, they, they will acknowledge that. And then, and then I can go on to say, well, you know, people who endorse those items are more authoritarian. You probably say, well, what is that? And I say authoritarianism is the belief that there are certain socially dominant groups in society that uh, are entitled to continue to hold power over the rest of society and to dictate what the other groups of people should do. Mm -hmm. And authoritarian people like the power dynamic the way it is, namely white, well-to-do, Christian, heterosexuals, um, basically running society. Mm -hmm. and, and they, you know, I, I think if I had a conversation with one of them, they probably wouldn't apologize for that. They would say, well, yeah, that, that's what I grew up with. That's what makes sense. It makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. And they would look at me and say, um, what's wrong with that? Mm. And uh, so, so I think uh, there is a chance <laughs> that we could actually have a, 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 a certain degree of illumination about the foundations of political thought, belief, and action around a, an agreed upon definition of what wokeness is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm optimistic by nature. I can't help but feel that it could be beneficial. 
I know that, that I'm going to get disappointed down the road because that probably won't happen to the extent that I wish it to. But mm. um, I would, if nothing more, I, I just want to get, um, I want to inject into this social discourse um, some well conceptualized, empirically based assessment of what wokeism is. So at least we can argue about that. Because right now we're arguing about just the wrong definitions or you mm. know, different definitions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it still giving us grief? It updated the entire software. <laughs> like it went from Windows 10 to Windows 11. <laughs> yeah, Great job, they, yeah. They have these automatic updates, which, which happen randomly, it seems to me. Why they can't do them at 2 in the morning, I don't I, know. I know, I don't know. Very okay. disruptive. Anyway. All right. Okay. Cool. You can ask that now. Oh, yes. I guess my question was, did you consider as well your harms of wokeism, including ableism? Yes. And so ableism is a, a form of discrimination against people who are less able or even handicapped in a particular domain. So in my own experience, I've had a hearing loss since I was a child. So I've been aware that sometimes people don't act very um, uh, attentively or sympathetically around situations of um, noisy environments where I can't hear. Um, so, you know, as, as discrimination goes, that's not the worst thing in the world, of course, but, but other people who have other kinds of physical or cognitive deficits can actually be um, quite harmed, emotionally harmed by discrimination that, that they feel. So, long answer to a, a good question, which is, yes, I think ableism would be really useful and interesting to include. When I put this together, I was mostly thinking about the um, um, Christian religion, but there's a long history of anti-Semitism that is unfortunately coming to the fore again um, with a worldwide uh, conservative and authoritarian movement that we that we see in Europe as, as well as um, the United States. And anti-Semitism seems to be pretty much a universal in that. And, and I thought maybe anti-Semitism should be added as well. But it, in some ways, it, it's captured by the uh, Christian nationalism in the sense of this discrimination against um, religions that are not Christian-based. And, and some people will discriminate against Jewish people because they're not Christian even though the, the two religions are affiliated historically. Uh, and there may be others. So just looking into the future, I, I envision, um, I, I probably won't uh, work long enough in my career to, to really pursue this adequately, but I think in every country around the world, you could probably identify four or five to seven or eight different forms of social injustice that are unique to those to that particular place and that particular history. Um, I think discrimination against different racial groups is an obvious thing. I think discrimination against uh, girls and women, unfortunately, is probably ubiquitous. It's probably everywhere. Um, so there's going to be an interesting... Um, differences in terms of which social injustices are more prominent and which are, are less noticeable in different locations and at different times. So if we follow uh, woke, wokeness over time, I think we'll see some of them waxing and waning in terms of their importance over spans of decades, for example. Uh, so there's a huge number of really interesting future directions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. And another thought I had is that it, I imagine it could be quite validating for some people to say, you know, if someone's uh, a bit older and maybe they struggle to keep up with the um, US progressive lingo, but then they actually find, oh, I'm actually quite woke. Or maybe conservative people might um, fill out the questionnaire and say, oh, actually, I'm quite woke. Or I do have higher empathy than I, than I thought I did, or, you know? Yes. 
I didn't say this earlier, but I'll say it now. The the actual scale when you sit down and fill it out has at the as the title um, attitudes about public life. So mm -hmm. there's nothing about wokeism, about woke attitudes or behaviors in any of the items or in the title or any of that. Right. So when people complete this form, they are seemingly just responding to social issues. Mm -hmm. um, your question is, that, is, is getting at the issue of what's the connection between the actual values and beliefs that you hold and your self-identification as woke or anti-woke. And in my data, I found a weak positive correlation between endorsing woke attitudes on the scale and calling yourself woke. Just weak. It's like positive 0.2 or something uh, as a correlation. What that means is that there are woke people who are not calling themselves woke on the, on the scale, who don't label themselves as highly woke, even though on the scale they are. And there are some anti-woke people who will call themselves a little more woke than they their beliefs really indicate they should be. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so there's some slippage between what you actually believe and think about sexism, racism, and so forth, um, and in conjunction ways. with the label that you're going to call yourself. And that's that just by itself is fascinating, I think. Mm. Did you have any other questions? No, I'm good for now. Thanks. Yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to add? You feel well. I, first of all, I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about something that I find very interesting. And and uh, when I talk to my family, they're less interested in it <laughs> <laughs> for some reason. Um, it's probably the source that uh, they, they just think I'm lecturing again. This was not a lecture per se. This, I <laughs> hope this was more of a conversation. Um, and I hope it stimulated some thinking out there in the wider world, whether whatever, wherever you are on this scale. And I, and I really don't want to make um, a judgment about that. But I, I want to use the scale as a way to, as you were intimating, as a way of kind of um, raising your own consciousness about what you believe, what you think, and what you call yourself in this political discourse around wokeism. And if we, if, if somebody can think a little more clearly about that, a little more, um, a little more insightfully about what that means and doesn't mean, then I think that would be a good thing. Awesome. That's nice. Awesome. Should we wrap it up there? Yeah. Sorry. Thank you so much. Yeah. Ooh. We do have a few. We do have one last thing to finish on. Yeah. This is not social questions, but these are a few rapid fire questions for you. I think it's slightly longer, I guess, as we go through. Yeah. But we want you to give the answer of the first thing which comes to your mind. Yeah. If you're comfortable. Well, easy. Cool. Okay. Summer or winter? Summer. Movie or TV series? TV series. I'm watching a lot of Netflix series right now. If your life were a Netflix series, what genre would it belong to? Supernatural slash horror slash suspense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's your weapon of choice? Weapon? Yeah. My quick wit. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, which superpower would you like to have? Which one? Which superpower would you like to have? To know what people are thinking. That's why I'm in psychology. Yeah. Can't read people's minds yet? No. But, Working on it. You know, get, getting them to out a questionnaire helps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is the ugliest fruit or vegetable? Are you familiar with the ugly fruit? I've heard of it. I don't know what it looks like, actually. It's ugly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, as the name suggests. Yeah. What's, some, what's something strange or what's the strangest thing someone's tricked you into believing? Oh, that um, the taste of liver is actually good. <laughs> <laughs> I remember people trying to convince me that cooked liver... This is in my childhood. It actually tasted good. And I would taste it and go, no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
it's all right. It's not a conspiracy I'll... theory, but it's a... <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all right. I've had worse things. <laughs> like what? Uh, some live fish and things. They're not very tasty. Mm. But, yeah. Well. Or okra. Okra's no good. I don't mind okra. What, what's okra? It's, it's a it's a thin vegetable, green vegetable, and people don't like the um, viscousness mm. of the, the. But if you just uh, air fry it or put it in the oven and bake it, it it's not gooey like mm. that. So, uh, so try that. Get to know. But there's nothing you can do to liver that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good for you, isn't it? Awesome. Well, if you think about what the organ does, mm -hmm. it filters out all the poisons and toxins in your system. So yeah. not so much. <laughs> they they tried to uh, convince people to eat it back in the old days um, because it was cheap. Yeah. And, and the argument was that it was healthy for you. But it turns out not so much. Um, what's a saying or phrase that people say that you think is complete BS? You can do anything if you try hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, when I was a child, I kind of believed that. And then I realized that there are constraints in the, in the world. And it's actually the wise person who decides when to stop at something. I did research on learned helplessness as a result of this very saying. Um, and it's bad to give up persevering or, or you know, stop being gritty. Um, people say, and, and the science shows that, but I've never researched this, but I think the wise person is one who realizes that they're banging their head against the wall and never going to really be good at swimming, so give up. Yeah, I feel like it's a, that seems to relate to uh, the wokeness scale. Like There are some barriers for some people and for forms of discrimination that we may not be aware of. Make it yeah, hard. yeah, I, yeah. You didn't ask me this question. Well, I'll tell you now, which you probably obviously can't use. But the wokeness scale is basically capturing skewed perceptions. Mm. And by skewed perception, I'm talking about on both ends. So if you're a poor person who's transsexual and not white, mm. you you have ample evidence and experiences to support your view that you've been discriminated against. And if you're a white, straight person with you know middle class background, you look around and say, well, what what discrimination? You don't see it. Mm. And and so these these people live in really different environments and they just feel uncomfortable to look at the other side. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the 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 person in the first case is certainly aware of the privileged people, so it doesn't hurt them. To consider that they they know it's true, but it's really um, can be hurtful or unsettling. Might be a better word for the entitled person to look at somebody who's being disadvantaged. Mm. It's uncomfortable because then they're supposed to feel guilt. And there's a lot of discourse about um, you know trying to make white people feel bad about the fact that black people have been mistreated all these years. And mm. I don't want to feel bad about that, so we're not going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Should we just ask the last question? The last question. Cool. And finally, if you had to give one piece of advice for us to leave with, what would it be? About life in general. About life in general. Be in the moment. I do a lot of research on mindfulness and um, be in the moment because that's all you got. And the future is uncertain and the past is gone. So if you got the present, you, you've got life. And if you can engage with stuff in the moment, right now, then you're living life. So many people skate through life. They don't, they don't, they're not in the moment. Mm -hmm. well, that's great advice. That's great. Thank, Thank you so much. I could come back and talk, you know, two hours about mindfulness. <laughs> uh, mindfulness special. <laughs> we'll have you back on. Yeah, mindfulness yeah. special. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on. I don't even get wine out of this. So it's, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next time we should offer people a drink. <laughs> no, this, yeah. was, this was fun. You guys were really attentive. Even when I was boring, you, you pretended to be paying attention. And, uh, 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 thank, cool. thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And, yeah, until next time, live in the moment. Yes. Hey. Totally. <laughs>